Please be seated. Today I want to share with you another passage from the Gospel of Matthew as Jesus is teaching us what it means to be a true leader. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fingers long. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues, and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one another, and you all are students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be servant, and all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who are humbled themselves will be exalted. There's a wonderful, wonderful series that aired on HBO years ago called A Band of Brothers. Any of you familiar with that? It follows a group of soldiers from the 506 101st Airborne, and it focuses on one of the companies, Easy Company, in that mix. Now, as it turns out, in World War II in the European theater, Easy Company was right on the front lines of everything that happened there. And part of their great history is the Battle of the Bulge, where they were just brutally bombed daily in cold winter without enough supplies and blankets and clothing and weapons, and yet they held their ground. One of the characters that they feature in this is a fellow named Richard Winters, and as you watch the series, you watch him go from lieutenant to uh, captain to major, but Lu Richard Winter was a leader. He was, in my mind, the consummate leader, and I love this man as I watched him live his life through the war on the screen. But what's unique about this series is that there were survivors of the 101st who are interviewed throughout the course of the series, and Richard Winters is one of them. And he's this very soft-spoken man, very contemplative, very deliberate. And one of the reasons why I love him is because I project on him Bill Sims. Kay's husband, late husband, Bill. Same thing. Those of you who know Bill, am I right? There's this man who just has this calm spirit about him, yet he's as strong as a rock. He was a leader. He is able to just take any situation, and you trust him as he would guide you through. It's the same with Richard Winters, Dick Winters, and the company, uh, or, um, thank you, Band of Brothers. So, a couple of things happen in this. One of the interviews Richard Winters gives is about leadership. And he says in his one, he says, a leader leads in all situations. You can't choose which ones you want to lead in and which ones you don't want to lead in. You have to lead in every situation, regardless of the cost, regardless of the risk. You may die in doing so, but you have to lead. And then they go and talk to these men who were in his company, he said, I, mean, I don't know how he did it. He, he led the charge of every attack that we did. I, I thought he'd get killed, but somehow he didn't. He was always, I would follow Dick Winters anywhere, whereas other officers, I wouldn't walk into a pool of water with them. One of the scenes, too, before they land on D-Day, one of his subordinates, Buck Compton, who's also a lieutenant, was trying to build rapport with his company and he was gambling with them, darts, cards, you know. And, and so Bill Winters saw him doing it, and he's writing back, and he's saying, Buck, don't ever gamble with your men. And he says, what's wrong? You're afraid they're going to like me? He says, what if you would have won? Buck looked at him. What? 
What if you would have won and you had taken them? At, don't ever take anything from these men. They're giving all that they have. Don't ever take anything from them. And it just gives you a sense of what kind of leader he is. He was not going to lay the burden and the responsibility on everyone around them. He took it on and led them through it. And when I think of that wonderful series, as I think of this wonderful man, Dick Winters, and I hear this passage, I think this is exactly the kind of person Jesus is calling us to be as leaders. He's warning his own people, you can follow the teachings of the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus was not anti-Jewish, he was Jewish, but he wanted his people to rise above their religion and rise above tradition and see the true meaning and the, and, the, and the treasure in all the things that were taught. But he says, do not do as them because they do not practice what they preach and they lay a heavy burden upon the people and they lift not one finger to try to make it easier. I think one of the horrible things that religion has done to people throughout the centuries is it has laid a heavy burden on people who are seeking diligently and honestly and genuinely for who God is and how they're going to be in a relationship with God. One of the great challenges I have as a counselor is helping people get through the shame and the guilt. You cannot ever heal and grow and fulfill your, your truest self if you are constantly riddled with shame and with guilt and the burden that it creates for you in your life. And one of the things that a lot of religion does is do what? It motivates with shame and guilt. Oh, you are all lucky. You're lucky today. You're sinners, all the lot of you. You're lucky today that I am standing here on your behalf because God is ready to smoke you at any moment. Oh, you are lucky that you can even stand up and walk because you are the lowest. I heard that, and I have not only in my religion, but in religions all over the world, that God is just waiting to smoke you with just anything that you do. How can you grow close to? How can you love anything that you're always afraid is going to kill you? And Jesus came to tell us, no, God is very different than that. Don't let the religion keep a burden on you, but rather see it as something that is true to who you are. And you love God because you love God. You love God because God loves you. And in this love is where we are enlightened. It's in this love that we find our purpose. He goes on to describe the Pharisees of those who self grandize themselves, right? They want the best seats. They want to be greeted in the marketplace. They want everyone to see how righteous and wonderful and holy they are. But Jesus offers a warning to people who need to exalt themselves. The exalted will be humbled, and those who are humble will be exalted. But let's look at real quickly for the word humble. Oftentimes we think of the word humble as something that's kind of weak and kind of pushover. Oh, he's so humble. People step on him all the time. Oh, poor soul. No, no, I, I call that weakness. Humility can only be born in the greatest strength. You, you see what I'm saying? You see, if I am an insecure person, I must constantly remind you of how powerful I am. And there is no humility in that. Any of you ever worked for someone who doesn't really quite believe that they are the boss or they have to prove it to you every day? I'm sorry to bring up something so traumatic for you. We'll <laughs> have a spare. But you know what I'm talking about. People who are not sure of their power, so they're constantly trying to prove their power. And they make life hell for everybody around them. Am I right? Humble people live in their power. Therefore, they can do the greatest things or they can do the simplest things because their power is not on trying to prove themselves to others, but their power comes from an inherent sense that they are connected to self, God, and the world around them. Some of the greatest people throughout human history on this planet who have changed history by their presence here, what kind of personalities were they? people who have incredible strength, but also humility as well. 
Jesus, I believe, was the most powerful person who ever walked this planet. And whenever his time came, he knew what was going to happen to him. There was no sense in arguing, trying to defend himself, or even trying to accuse. But he looked his accusers in the eye, and he stared them down the whole way. Do what you have to do. I have the power to take your life. You have no power other than what God gives you. Do what you must do. He was able to wash his disciples' feet, a job that was usually left for servants. That's why none of the disciples wanted to do it. A man who could literally change the human race was as powerful as a human being could be, but also could do the humblest acts. And Jesus did this so that he would show us how to truly live. Now you know as your pastor, and those of you who've heard me preach now for many years, some of you have been hearing me now preach for 19 and a half years. If you've been here with me from the beginning, yeah, here you go. Some are ashamed to admit it, but yes, I know. I One thing that you do not hear me do is throw you down the shame and the guilt conflict. Am I right? I don't need to. Those of you who are guilty here today do not need me to remind you of that or to let you know that somehow God is going to throw more on you. You feel guilty enough as it is. Those of you who come from a Catholic tradition, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can really do for you. The, the joke is that the Jews invented guilt and the Catholics perfected it. <clears throat> what I want you to see, that there is nothing in this world that you can say or do or have done to separate you from the true love of God. And that when you live in your strength and when you live in your power and when you live in redemption, when you live in forgiveness, it increases your capacity not only to love yourself and to move on, but then to have a greater love for humanity around you. That, I think, is the goal. So Windermere Union Church, only thing I call you to do And whether it's a burden, I don't know. But I don't think there's just you have no responsibility in your spiritual journey. If that's the case, you will never have it. You have to walk the path wherever it leads you. But here's what we are responsible for. Know who we are. Discover the incredible power and the spirit that's within us. And live into that power and fulfill that power that's within us. And then in doing so, fulfill the purpose or purposes in which God has placed on us. And to do it from a place of love. Not a need to brag or insecurity or weakness or self-righteousness or fear. But do it from a place of genuine love. I care, I share, I give because it's a genuine expression of who I am as a human being. And that's the call to us as the church as well. God knows that the world does not need another legalistic, condemning, guilt, and shaming institution to have his name attached to. But what God does need are communities of faith who take their purpose and their mission upon this earth seriously. And we want to grow, and we want to learn, and we want to expand and become more and more enlightened so that when we are the light of the world, we're a bright, shining light in this world. Look, I have no desire to be a tolerant church. Tolerance to me still means that somehow I am above you, but I'm going to tolerate you. What I challenge us to be, and this is what we are and what we continue to become, is not a tolerant church, but an accepting and embracing church. That no matter who you are, what the color of your skin is, what your first language is, what your education is, what your sexual orientation is, no, it doesn't matter where you lived, where you went to school. None of it matters. What matters is what kind of human being are you and are you going to join us and being a leader in the world saying this is who 
church is. This is what Christ has called us to do and to be. And here we are, and we do it not because we're afraid God's going to smote us and take our building down, but we do it because we love one another. We love God, and we love the world around us. And that's why we do what we do. This is why we are who we are. And this is why we can do the humblest task of a, as a congregation and then sometimes do the most grandiose things and usually live somewhere in between. It's because it comes from a place of love, relationship with God, self, and others. This is the magic of this community. Not only, do we not, not only do we know who we are, but we're clear on our purpose as well, and that is our power. So answer the call. There's always room for more enlightenment. Do whatever it is you need to do to take the stumbling blocks out of the way. God will help you. I will help you. The church will help you. Whatever it is that keeps you from experiencing fully the love that I'm talking about, that's your job, is to do whatever it takes to take those stumbling blocks out of the way so that you can walk a path where you can experience completely the love that Jesus is talking about here. And then that's when we become humble leaders, powerful leaders. And we will lead the charge no matter where it takes us in this world. No matter where. Because a leader leads all the time. Even if it leads to a cross, you lead. Even if it leads to resurrection, you lead. Thus ends the lesson. Amen. I'm going to ask Del Berry if he will come and assist me this morning with communion. He is one of our Stevens ministers. And as he's coming.